Well, I am glad to see your faces this morning. Um, some of this this morning is going to kind of carry on from where we were, or maybe even be a little bit of a, a repeat of last week, as it just kind of, um, we went a little different direction as the Lord was leading last week, and so it, it changed. And who knows, I never know how these things are going to come out until I actually get here. Um, that's just how it works. But anyway, God bless everybody here. You know, it's interesting, we often talk about what it means to be separate, what it means to be holy. We look at this, how then shall we live? You know, that's the question that believers should be asking. I mean, how then shall we live? If, if we have such a great salvation, if we have uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords as our, as our king, as our guide, if we have um, this object, uh, not just some object of worship, but a person who walks with us and talks with us and tells us we are his own, if we have, and that is who we are, and we're part of this royal priesthood and part of this royal family, then the question really should come down to, well, then how then shall we live? You know, I grew up in a family in, in Alaska, and, I, and there were certain expectations, pretty honorable bunch of people, but, um, but there were certain expectations that went along with that. Certainly, there are much greater expectations that come with being part of the family of God. So... We often talk a lot about what true holiness is and, and about the difference between legalism and holiness. You know, legalism tends to tie our works to salvation, and it adds law where there is no law. And as we say, it's just as wrong to add law as it is to take away. It's just as wrong to add to Scripture as it is to take away from Scripture. That's something a lot of churches don't quite understand, that it's wrong to add law where there is no law. And it's wrong to attach any of those works to what saves us. But as the people of God, we certainly should ask then, how then shall we live? How then should we live? If we're part of this, this royal family, if we're part of the kingdom of God, then how then should we live? What does, a, what does a holy man or woman look like? And somebody will say, it's not supposed to be about looks. And you're right. <laughs> what is your life supposed to be like? You know, it's an interesting thing. Throughout generations, churches have argued and battled over what a holy person should, quote, look like. And really, it should be about what should a holy person be like? What should a holy person be like? It's easy to get all tripped up on what they should look like because that's easy. It's something you just visually see. But what should a person who is really a part of the kingdom of God be like? What are the marks? What's the, what's the fruit of holiness? We see in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight through 31, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Now, that's a very interesting scripture. It is talking about sharing in the Lord's Supper. But interesting, it also says, this is the reason that many are weak and sickly among you. This how then shall we live thing is pretty important. It plays into everything. A lot of times people think they have their spiritual life and their physical life, and they're like two different things. They're not two different things. We are spiritual beings, as has been said. We are not, I mean, that we are actually a soul that happens to be wandering around in a body. And the fact is, it's that soul that matters. What is within a man? What is within a woman? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6 says, Examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. It's interesting. He's writing this letter to the Corinthians. The first one that he sent was a letter of correction. They were in error. They were all messed up. They were focusing on the wrong things. They had all kinds of stuff that was crossed up in the church. And he sends a letter of correction. The second one is more positive. It seems they had turned around some. But he still says, examine yourself. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Well, that tends to beg the question, <clears throat> what are you looking for? If you're going to examine yourself, what are you looking for? I mean, maybe some of us would say, well, I, I seem like a nicer person since I came to Jesus. You know, I'm... I think I'm nicer. Uh, um, I go to church now and stuff, and I memorized a bunch of the songs. Um, it should be more to it than that. There should be something more. And so one of the things that jumps out, and we think about it, and it, it sounds like one of those boring things that preachers talk about, 
simple morality. It's morality. And when we think about morality, a lot of times people's heads immediately go to thinking about things like sexual immorality and all that kind of stuff. But morality is about the context of and character of our entire life. It's about, you know, whether you happen to tell the truth on a regular basis. It's about your integrity. It's about how you deal with others. It's about how you conduct your business dealings, your family dealings, all of it. Morality plays into the entire picture of our lives. And it ought to be guided by the fact that we are the children of God. We are the children of God, and that ought to change us. Ephesians 5, 8 through 12 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. The believer should grieve for the immorality in the world and not give in to it. We should be different. 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5 says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked around in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them to the same flood of dissipation. Speaking evil of you, they will give an, who will give an, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You know, I read that scripture through a few times this week, and I read it through this morning, and I just thought, <clears throat> that's just a description of my young life, right? And I think there's probably quite a few people in here that can relate and can say, wow, that was me. I walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. And I've covered all those bases, and yet the Lord set me free, and if he set us free... Should we then continue to walk in the things that he has set us free from? The sin that so easily entangles. The things that wrap us up. Man. See, this is not just about fornication and all those things, although it's certainly in the picture. But it's about integrity and honesty and caring about the people around you. And taking on the mission of Christ. I think the church has struggled for a long time with being the moral center in society. Because frankly, it's often not that moral. Just kind of like everybody else, you know. Just kind of live for the same means, the same reasons. Think it's okay to, you know, we used to have a saying that all's fair in love, war, and business. And uh, we lived that way back in the day back in those days of lewdness and all the other stuff. We also lived in this all's fair and love war and business. If you were in business and you could, I had, I had a business partner in construction in Alaska. One time he played some things around with some paperwork, cheated me out of 10,000 bucks. And you know what I did? I shook his hand and congratulated him. I said, man, that was good. Because that's the world we lived in. I was impressed He managed to cheat me. I was impressed. I'd probably done the same thing to him. I'm not the same person I used to be. It was a different life, a different culture. The church is not going to be an agent of change in the world until it stops being like the world. It's just true. And I'm not talking about how we dress and how we cut our hair, all those things people trying to cross into. I'm talking about the fact that we act differently. We act differently, or we should. The second thing I'd like to cover in this examining ourselves is selflessness and surrender. We know a lot about selfishness, but selflessness is a big deal. You know that all sin comes from selfishness. That's why Jesus gave us the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you were always loving the Lord your God with all your heart and you were always loving your neighbor, you would not commit sin. It's just reality. So it all flows back to selfishness. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what I want. Or as the enemy tempted Eve in the garden and said, you shall be as God. You shall be like God. He's lying to you. Well, if you wanted to be like God, I personally just want to be with God. I just want to walk with him. I want to know him. Putting others first, not thinking about our own personal advancement. Jesus shares with his disciples a pretty hard teaching on sacrifice, and they really struggle with it. John 6, 61 through 69 says, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, because he just preached this entire thing 
about really being surrendered to the Lord. So they said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now, folks... Once you've come to that revelation, what Peter's talking about, and you know I've shared this with you before, that I don't believe, a lot of times people just take one verse and they'll, they'll quote it, you know, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. They don't take the context there of, if you really look at that section of Scripture, it's Paul saying, I can do all things even though I've been beaten and shipwrecked and frozen and hungry. And I mean, all these things is not just talking about us leaping tall buildings in a single bound. It's saying, I can endure all things for the sake of the gospel because I have the strength of Christ within me. And so here we have another one where people will quote, you know, um, to whom else would we go? Lord, you have the words of eternal life. See, all these guys just turned around and went back because he just preached this really hard message. And I think that what Peter's saying is, to whom else would we go? You know, I don't think he was necessarily jumped up on a rock as a podium and went, to whom else would we go? But rather he went, hey, once you've had this revelation, once you realize who Jesus really is, you have to do something with that. And it can shake you to the core. Yes. Because all of a sudden, you have to do something with it. If you really understand who he is, to whom else would I go? All these guys turned back and went back as they had a habit of doing whenever Jesus preached any kind of count the cost type message. <clears throat> and yet the disciples are there. He says, do you want to go too? They said, where else would we go? We see who you are now. You can't unsee that. You have to do something with it. It's also saying you cannot come and let to the new unless they're willing to leave the old. You can't have both worlds. You have to make a choice. Look at the model of Jesus who left the riches of heaven to become poor for the sake of others, for the sake of us. And you see that over and over again in Scripture. Moses, Abraham, the disciples, leave your worldly stuff and your selfish goals and come and follow me. You see it over and over and over again. Third thing I like to show as, a, as we examine ourselves is that we should have purpose and hope. Folks, if we really understand what we have in Christ, we should have purpose and hope. We should know why we get out of bed in the morning. <clears throat> and we know that we don't just raise children, we raise children for a purpose. We don't just go to work. We go to work for a purpose. We don't just, you know, relate to people during a day. We relate to people for a purpose because we have a purpose and a hope, and it's a hope that we can share. It's a living hope. Man. But it doesn't really work if you're not completely sold out to Christ because then you're just kind of like everybody else, and they're going to look at you and say, doesn't seem to me you have any more purpose or hope than I do. And you're not going to be able to answer them because you're going to go, I don't really. But they talk about it in church a lot. I thought years ago as I'd go into this congregation that I, I was first part of when I was just a teenager. <clears throat> and they would sing this song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Yeah, there you go. But I used to look around the room and go, Man, it must be way down in their heart. <laughs> it's so far down it can't show on their face. I mean, they're just, they're just, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Mm. I got the peace that passes understanding way down in the depths of my heart. Um, and they're thinking, man, that is really deep. It's way down there. But we should have purpose and hope. But we won't have purpose and hope if we're not walking the way God wants us to walk. 
Um, 2 Timothy 1, 11, 12 says, Wherefore I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In that is purpose and hope. Paul was appointed to what he was appointed to. You'd be appointed to what you're appointed to. But the reality is that's purpose. Hope is I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. My trust is in him. I am, I am not persuaded that I can keep what he's committed to me. I am persuaded that he can keep what he's committed to me. Bless the Lord. That's somebody who's made a decision. That's somebody who's staked his claim. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. People in this life need purpose. God's people have purpose. God's people need to walk in that purpose. And if we're not, we need to really examine ourselves. Now, the, the fourth and last one is something I touched on a little bit last week, that we declare and we proclaim the kingdom of God. This is what we declare and we proclaim. We know in Acts uh, 1-3, I don't have that one up for the screen, but Jesus, after his resurrection and before he ascended up to heaven, he spent time with his disciples. They were the ones who were going to establish the church. They were going to lead the church. And yet he did not spend that time discussing programs and strategies for church growth. He spent that time speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, hear me please on this. We need to not just be proclaiming Jesus. I know that's at the heart of things. We need to proclaim the kingdom of God. We have this message. But see, now in our recent days, in our more modern time, the gospel message has become simply, you pray this prayer and it gives you your ticket to heaven and you go, right? So you pray that prayer, you sign the spiritual laws track, whatever, and you say, okay, now I've got my ticket to heaven and I'm going to go on with my life. But when you proclaim the things of the kingdom of God, it is part and parcel of the gospel to do so because we preach Jesus, as we preach Christ crucified and risen again as the entrance into the kingdom of God. And if people could grasp this part and include this part, they would naturally say, how then shall we live? Naturally. We wouldn't just be leaving people at the altar and saying, oh, good, you're good now. Now you get to go to heaven. Now if I end up having to do your funeral, I'll have something good to say. I can be positive is more than that that we proclaim the things of the kingdom of God. And I really believe, guys, it's something of a revelation that it's been largely lost in our, in our church culture to actually proclaim that when you are saved, you are moving from one kingdom to another. You are moving. It's a lot better than the Jeffersons and the moving on up thing. It's really moving on up. But it is the leaving of one kingdom for another. It is the leaving of one kingdom for another. And if you remember, I think last week I mentioned it, a lot of Christians are confused because they're trying so hard to make this world make sense. And you look at, especially when all this political stuff is going on, and you come to realize a lot of people have come to worship the state and not the Lord. And it's become idolatry. Guys, when you enter the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ, by his blood, you move from one kingdom to another. And the confusion and the lack of purpose and a lot of it tends to come from people just not quite getting that. And their life is consumed with all the stuff in this kingdom and not the things of the kingdom of God. There has to be an integral part of the message. Really, if our evangelistic message is simply to be saved from our sins and we just leave people hanging there, sitting around waiting to hopefully go to heaven. We're saved unto the kingdom of God. It's important because if we focus only on a personal relationship with Christ, 
which has almost become a cliche word now, even though we can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If we only focus on that, we're not showing that there's a responsibility to being part of the family. That there's a responsibility to being part of this family. This wonderful family of God. That we're born again for purpose. To proclaim, to worship. But if you look at Jesus' model of ministry, it was to proclaim the things of the kingdom of God. To proclaim the things of the kingdom of God. You know, what, and we talk about what are these things? What does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? And you know, on, on Wednesday nights we've been going through Matthew. I'll tell you, it's been challenging for me. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep moving because every verse is like a sermon. We could be there like 20 years, you know. And so, you know, when you're sitting there as you're, you're teaching a Bible study, you, you try to balance this because sometimes if you, if you move too slow, people miss the, the conceptual reality of what's there. And yet you don't want to speed over something that's super important. And it's all super important. But if you look at Matthew chapter 5, which, of course, begins with the Beatitudes. And we've been in Matthew chapter 5 for a while on Wednesday nights. And, uh, and so as you look at these Beatitudes and you think about the fact that this is the first message that Jesus really speaks to his disciples when he's first sitting down and telling them, this is what it's all about. And the whole thing is about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom is and what it means to be a kingdom person, believer. And it's hard. And if you think about their setting, I know if you're there Wednesday night, then I'm repeating myself. But you know what? That setting is the Messiah. They're all thinking this might be the Messiah. This might be the one that's going to come. And their thing is they're hoping he'll be like the warrior king David or the warrior king Joshua. The warrior Joshua, and so the word king. But they're looking for somebody to rise up like that, a deliverer, a great military deliverer who's going to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans, and they're going to be put on top of things, and everything's just going to be awesome. And then Jesus says, blessed are the humble, the meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness, when people shall revile you and accuse you falsely, you're to be salt and light in a dark world. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. If someone steals your shirt, you're supposed to give them your cloak as well. Man, imagine the moment. Imagine the ones that are sitting there going, yeah, he's going to rise up. Any time now, he's going to start Viva La Revolution. And then he preaches this as his first message to those who would go forward to serve him. Wow. No wonder a bunch of people go home. That's not what I signed up for. I signed up for the God who's going to make me tough and give me victory over all of my enemies. And all of a sudden he says, nah, that's not why I'm here. And that's not what my kingdom's about. He says to Pilate, even when he's before him, hey, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would rise up and fight. But my kingdom's not of this world. Guys, it's almost just this frustrating thing that so many professing believers can read through Matthew chapter 5 and then just kind of blow the whole thing off. <laughs> I mean, honestly, just kind of go, oh, no, that's not really what he meant. It's pretty clear. We're the ones who are somewhat destined to be beaten up, stomped on, and taken advantage of. That's what it says. Yes, I know that in our time, everybody's, you know, and I understand it. I get it with all the my rights, my rights, my rights. But you know what? We need to look to God and say, I'm willing to be sacrificed for the sake of the kingdom. I want to serve in the way that God would have me serve. And if it says, if someone steals my shirt, I should give them my cloak as well, then you know what? If they steal my shirt, I'm going to give them my cloak as well. Now, Matthew 13, 44 through 46 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it. He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The parable 
Oh, the, that's the parable for, uh, I forgot that actually got in there. Never mind, that's not in the scripture. That's one of those title headings. Again, the he- kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Do you see how this is about leaving one kingdom for another? It's about leaving the goals you once had for another. They sold everything they had for that pearl of great price. And what was that pearl of great price? It is Jesus Christ. And it means that we're willing to sacrifice everything on the altar for the sake of Jesus Christ. That we're willing, we realize how precious this entrance into the kingdom is. So we're not going to hang on and try to cling to this world because we understand that this world is not our home. This is not our home. I think I'd get this if, 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 you know, when I'd given my life to Jesus Christ, if maybe the Lord just grabbed me and dropped me in some weird tribe somewhere in the world. Whoa! This is what I was doing? I mean, why is it surrender my life and they just drop me in this place? I don't know the language. I don't know any of it. None of it makes sense to me. Well, this world that we live in, guys, I don't really even know the language. I mean, I, I listen to stuff and I just go, what are they talking about? People are insane. And it ought to be that way. It ought to be that way. I look around at the culture and I don't understand it. It's not my home. I look around at people willing to stomp on each other in order to get where they want to go and I just don't get it. I look at people who just will lie, cheat, and steal to get their goals and I I just don't understand. And we shouldn't because it's not our world. And so many people are driving themselves crazy. Those four in the morning moments when you wake up and you're just churning and they're driving themselves crazy because they're trying to make this world make sense to them. And it's not meant to make sense to us. And in fact, if this world makes sense to you, there's a problem. It's just crazy. But we're part of a different world and we're strangers and aliens in a foreign land. This is not our home. We look forward to a city with foundations whose builder and whose maker is God. We have one redemption, one hope, and that's Jesus Christ. The Jesus who said, blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are the humble and blessed are, you know, you and people revile and hate you and call you names and, and uh, you know, say false things against you, make false accusations. Blessed are you. You go, how, how's that blessed? You need Jesus to change your heart and mind. You need Jesus to change your heart and mind. How could that be blessed? It's blessed because it's happening because you are a child of the living God. It's not like they're sitting there. You see the scripture where it says they joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. That's a mind-blowing scripture. Yeah. How would I do that? Well, the point is they were doing it because of their faith in Jesus Christ. It's the same thing as when Paul and Silas are beaten because they've been preaching the gospel and they come out of there singing and thanking the Lord, praising the Lord that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Wow, what a different way of thinking. That's because of a different kingdom. Oh, to be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Not suffer because I'm a jerk but suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is. Man, you sit there talking about examining yourself. If you're suffering because you're a believer, that's pretty good evidence, guys. But if all of your friends and family just think you're fine, they just say, oh, you know, they're, they're fine. They're, they're Christian, but they're just like us. There might be a problem. Yeah, they do that church thing, but they're just like us. I hope not. I hope you're like the crazy uncle or aunt that shows up. I only say their perception, crazy, not really crazy. But that they look and say, oh, that's my crazy uncle. All he does is talk about Jesus. That's my crazy aunt. She just talks about Jesus all the time. I hope you're that person. I hope you're that person. We proclaim the kingdom of God. We tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him, and that he gains us entrance 
into a kingdom of light and a kingdom of truth. So we don't have to continue to dwell in darkness. But until you let him change your heart, none of that Matthew 5 stuff is going to make any sense. It's just not. You're going to read Matthew 5 like a lot of people do and go, oh, Jesus is just talking about all these hypotheticals. No, he's not. He's saying this is the way you should think and this is the way you should live. Whether you like it or not. (laughs) As part of the kingdom of the living God. And understanding then that we're part of a royal family and that everything we do reflects on that family. And there's a responsibility there. There's a responsibility to serve, to love, to be kind, to seek, to serve. And we talk about serving the Lord, and that's great, but you know how you serve the Lord? You serve the Lord by serving others. (laughs) That's how it works. It's easy to say, oh, I just want to serve the Lord. You got to serve others. You got to get up in the morning, look around, and realize your purpose is those people. (laughs) Your purpose is those around you, not you. Those around you. Not how you can live your best life now, but how you can actually serve the Lord the way that He would have you serve Him. So that your heart changes to the place where you can understand, blessed are the poor in spirit. When we understand, we are no longer guided by the law of retribution. You know, law of retribution is the large thing before Jesus came. Somebody, you know, takes your cow, you go take his cow. That's how it worked. They kill your horse, you go kill their horse. Eye for an eye, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus said, no, that's not what I want you to do. Read chapter 5, Matthew now, hopefully you're curious enough, you're going to go home and read Matthew chapter 5. But, but, uh, but it, it, he says, this is no longer about the law of retribution. This is about the law of grace and mercy. And we're to live by that. The law of grace and mercy. Not the law of retribution. Yeah, that's our calling. And you can be part of that kingdom. You can be part of that kingdom. Be part of what God has for you, what he has for us together. And one day we'll see the complete fulfillment of that. But make no mistake, you enter the kingdom of God when you come to Jesus. You're a child of God. You're a child of the living God. Part of a royal family. Heirs together with Christ. It's not me, this is Jesus talking. Heirs together with him. So how then shall we live? How then shall we live? Father, we just give you thanks and praise. And we ask today, Lord, that you would uh, let us go back to your word. Let us go back to what you've said and not explain it away. Not turn from it. Not allow our culture to influence us beyond your word. God, help us to see through it and understand what our culture really is as as the people of the kingdom. It's your culture, Lord. It's what you would have us be. And I know it runs across the grain of so many worldly things. But God, help us. God, help us. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need your Holy Spirit. And we just give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless all of you. So, hallelujah. Look, I'm done early. What do you know? <laughs>